Chapter 7 of The Valley of Fear by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 The Solution. Next morning, after breakfast, we found Inspector MacDonald and White Mason seated in close consultation in the small parlour of the local police sergeant. On the table in front of them were piled a number of letters and telegrams, which they were carefully sorting and docketing. Three had been placed on one side. "'Still on the track of the elusive bicyclist?' Holmes asked cheerfully. "'What is the latest news of the ruffian?' MacDonald pointed ruefully to his heap of correspondence. "'He is at present reported from Leicester, Nottingham, Southampton, Derby, Eastmam, Richmond, and fourteen other places. In three of them, East Ham, Leicester, and Liverpool, there is a clear case against him, and he has actually been arrested.' This country seems to be full of the fugitives with yellow coats. Dear me, said Holmes sympathetically. Now, Mr. Mack, and you, Mr. White Mason, I wish to give you a very earnest piece of advice. When I went into this case with you, I bargained, as you will no doubt remember, that I should not present you with half-proved theories, but that I should retain and work out my own ideas until I had satisfied myself that they were correct. For this reason, I am not at the present moment telling you all that is in my mind. On the other hand, I said that I would play the game fairly by you, and I do not think it is a fair game to allow you for one unnecessary moment to waste your energies upon a profitless task. Therefore I am here to advise you this morning, and my advice to you is summed up in three words. Abandon the case. MacDonald and White Mason stared in amazement at their celebrated colleague. "'You consider it hopeless?' cried the inspector. "'I consider your case to be hopeless. I do not consider that it is hopeless to arrive at the truth.' "'But this cyclist is not an invention. We have his description, his valise, his bicycle. The fellow must be somewhere. Why should we not get him?' "'Yes, yes, no doubt he is somewhere.' And no doubt we shall get him, but I would not have you waste your energies in East Ham or Liverpool. I am sure that we can find some shorter cut to a result. You're holding something back. It's hardly fair of you, Mr. Holmes. The inspector was annoyed. You know my methods of work, Mr. Mack, but I will hold it back for the shortest time possible. I only wish to verify my details in one way, which can very readily be done, and then... I make my bow and return to London, leaving my results entirely at your service. I owe you too much to act otherwise, for in all my experience I cannot recall any more singular and interesting study. This is clean beyond me, Mr. Holmes. We saw you when we returned from Tunbridge Wells last night, and you are in general agreement with our results. What has happened since then to give you a completely new idea of the case? Well, since you ask me, I spent, as I told you that I would, some hours last night at the manor house. Well, what happened? Ah, uh, I can only give you a very general answer to that for the moment. By the way, I have been reading a short but clear and interesting account of the old building, purchasable at the mo modest sum of one penny from the local tobacconist. Here Holmes drew a small tract embellished with a rude engraving of the ancient manor-house from his waistcoat pocket. It immensely adds to the zest of an investigation, my dear Mr. Mack, when one is in conscious sympathy with the historical atmosphere of one's surroundings. Don't look so impatient, for I assure you that even so bald an account as this raises some sort of picture of the past in one's mind. Permit me to give you an example. Erected in the fifth year of the reign of James I, and standing upon the site of a much older building, the manor house of Burlston presents one of the finest surviving examples of the moated Jacobean residence. You're making fools of us, Mr. Holmes. Tut, tut, Mr. Mack. The first sign of temper I have detected in you. Well, I won't read it verbatim, since you feel so strongly upon the subject. 
But when I tell you that there is some account of the taking of the place by a parliamentary colonel in 1644 of the concealment of Charles for several days in the course of the Civil War, and finally of a visit there by the second George, you will admit that there are various associations of interest connected with this ancient house. I don't doubt it, Mr. Holmes, but that is no business of ours. Is it not? Is it not? Breadth of view, my dear Mr. Mack, is one of the essentials of our profession. The interplay of ideas and the oblique uses of knowledge are often of extraordinary interest. You will excuse these remarks from one who, though a mere connoisseur of crime, is still rather older and perhaps more experienced than yourself. I'm the first to admit that, said the detective heartily. You get to your point. I admit, but you have such a deuced round-the-corner way of doing it. Well, well, I'll drop past history and get down to present-day facts. I called last night, as I have already said, at the manor house. I did not see either Barker or Mrs. Douglas. I saw no necessity to disturb them, but I was pleased to hear that the lady was not visibly pining, and that she had partaken of an excellent dinner. My visit was specially made to the good Mr. Ames, with whom I exchanged some amiabilities which culminated in his allowing me, without reference to anyone else, to sit alone for a time in the study. "'What? With that?' I ejaculated. "'No, no, everything is now in order. You gave permission for that, Mr. Mack. As I am informed, the room was in its normal state, and in it I passed an instructive quarter of an hour. What were you doing? Well, not to make a mystery of so simple a matter, I was looking for the missing dumbbell. It has always bulked rather large in my estimate of the case. I ended by finding it. Where? Ah, there we come to the edge of the unexplored. Let me go a little further a very little further, and I will promise that you shall share everything that I know." "'Well, we're bound to take you on your own terms,' said the inspector. "'But when it comes to telling us to abandon the case, why, in the name of goodness, should we abandon the case?' "'For the simple reason, my dear Mr. Mack, that you have not got the first idea what it is that you are investigating.' "'We are investigating the murder of Mr. John Douglas of Burlston Manor.' "'Yes, yes, so you are. But don't trouble to trace the mysterious gentleman upon the bicycle. I assure you that it won't help.' "'Then what do you suggest we do?' "'I will tell you exactly what to do, if you will do it.' "'Well, I'm bound to say. I've always found you had reason behind all your queer ways. I'll do what you advise.' "'And you, Mr. White Mason?' The country detective looked helplessly from one to the other. Holmes and his methods were new to him. "'Well, if it is good enough for the inspector, it's good enough for me,' he said at last. "'Capital,' said Holmes. "'Well, then, I should recommend a nice, cheery country walk for both of you. They tell me that the views from Burlston Ridge over the Weald are very remarkable.' No doubt lunch could be got at some suitable hostelry, though my ignorance of the country prevents me from recommending one. In the evening, tired but happy— "'Man, this is getting past a joke!' cried MacDonald, rising angrily from his chair. "'Well, well, spend the day as you like,' said Holmes, patting him cheerfully upon the shoulder. "'Do what you like, and go where you will. But meet me here before dusk without fail.' "'Without fail, Mr. Mack. "'That sounds more like sanity.' "'All of it was excellent advice, "'but I don't insist so long as you are here when I need you. "'But now, before we part, "'I want you to write a note to Mr. Barker.' "'Well, I'll dictate it, if you like. "'Ready?' "'Dear Sir, "'it has struck me that it is our duty to drain the moat.' in the hope that we might find some—' "'It's impossible,' said the inspector. "'I've made inquiry. "'Tut, tut, my dear sir, please do what I ask you. "'We'll go on. "'In the hope that we might find something which may bear upon our investigation. 
I have made arrangements, and the workmen will be at work early tomorrow morning, diverting the stream. Impossible! Diverting the stream, so I thought it best to explain matters beforehand. Now, sign that, and send it by hand about four o'clock. At that hour we shall meet again in this room. Until then we may each do what we like, for I can assure you that this inquiry has come to a definite pause. Evening was drawing in when we reassembled. Holmes was very serious in his manner, myself curious, and the detectives obviously critical and annoyed. "'Well, gentlemen,' said my friend gravely, "'I am asking you now to put everything to the test with me, and you will judge for yourselves whether the observations I have made justify the conclusions to which I have come. It is a chill evening, and I do not know how long our expedition may last, so I beg that you will wear your warmest coats. It is of the first importance that we should be in our places before it grows dark, so with your permission we shall get started at once." We passed along the outer bounds of the Manor House Park until we came to a place where there was a gap in the rails which fenced it. Through this we slipped, and then, in the gathering gloom, we followed Holmes until we had reached a shrubbery which lies nearby opposite to the main door and the drawbridge. The latter had not been raised. Holmes crouched down behind a screen of laurels, and we all three followed his example. "'Well, what are we to do now?' asked MacDonald with some gruffness. "'Possess our souls in patience, and make as little noise as possible,' Holmes answered. "'What are we here for at all? I really think you might treat us with some more frankness.' Holmes laughed. <laughs> Watson insists that I am the dramatist in real life, said he. Some touch of the artist wells up within me, and calls insistently for a well-staged performance. Surely our profession, Mr. Mac, would be a drab and sordid one if we did not sometimes set the scene so as to glorify our results. The blunt accusation, the brutal tap upon the shoulder, what can one make of such a denouement? But the quick inference, the subtle trap, the clever forecast of coming events, the triumphant vindication of bold theories, are these not the pride and the justification of our life's work? At the present moment you thrill with the glamour of the situation and the anticipation of the hunt. Where would be that thrill if I had been as definite as a timetable? I only ask a little patience, Mr. Mac, and all will be clear to you. Well, I hope the pride and justification and the rest of it will come before we all get our death of cold, said the London detective with comic resignation. We all had good reason to join in the aspiration, for our vigil was a long and bitter one. Slowly the shadows darkened over the long, sombre face of the old house. A cold, damp reek from the moat chilled us to the bones and set our teeth chattering. There was a single lamp over the gateway, and a steady globe of light in the fatal study. Everything else was dark and still. "'How long is this to last?' asked the inspector finally. "'And what is it we're waiting for?' "'I have no more notion than you how long it is to last,' Holmes answered with some asperity. "'If criminals would always schedule their movements like railway trains, it would certainly be more convenient for all of us. As to what it is we—' Well, that's what we're watching for." As he spoke, the bright yellow light in the study was obscured by somebody passing to and fro before it. The laurels among which we lay were immediately opposite the window, and not more than a hundred feet from it. Presently it was thrown open with a whining of hinges, and we could dimly see the dark outline of a man's head and shoulders looking out into the gloom. For some minutes, he peered forth in furtive, stealthy fashion, as one who wishes to be assured that he is unobserved. Then he leaned forward, and in the intense silence we were aware of the soft lapping of agitated water. He seemed to be stirring up the moat with something which he held in his hand. Then suddenly he hauled something in as a fisherman lands a fish, some large round object which obscured the light as it was dragged through the open casement. "'Now!' cried Holmes. "'Now!' 
we were all upon our feet, staggering after him with our stiffened limbs, while he ran swiftly across the bridge and rang violently at the bell. There was the rasping of bolts from the other side, and the amazed Ames stood in the entrance. Holmes brushed him aside without a word, and followed by all of us, rushed into the room which had been occupied by the man whom we had been watching. The oil lamp on the table represented the glow which we had seen from outside. It was now in the hand of Cecil Barker, who held it towards us as we entered. Its light shone upon his strong, resolute, clean-shaved face and his menacing eyes. "'What the devil is the meaning of all this?' he cried. "'What are you after, anyhow?' Holmes took a swift glance around, and then pounced upon a sodden bundle tied together with cord which lay where it had been thrust under the writing-table. "'This is what we are after, Mr. Barker. This bundle, weighted with a dumbbell which you have just raised from the bottom of the moat.' Barker stared at Holmes with amazement in his face. "'How in thunder came you to know anything about it?' he asked. "'Simply that I put it there.' "'You put it there? You?' "'Perhaps I should have said, replaced it there,' said Holmes. "'You will remember, Inspector MacDonald, that I was somewhat struck by the absence of a dumbbell. I drew your attention to it, but with the pressure of other events you had hardly the time to give it the consideration which would have enabled you to draw deductions from it. When water is near, and a weight is missing, it is not a very far-fetched supposition that something has been sunk in the water. The idea was at least worth testing, so with the help of Ames, who admitted me to the room, and the crook of Dr. Watson's umbrella, I was able last night to fish up and inspect this bundle. It was of the first importance, however, that we should be able to prove who placed it there. This we accomplished by the very obvious device of announcing that the moat would be dried to-morrow, which had, of course, the effect that whoever had hidden the bundle would most certainly withdraw it the moment that darkness enabled him to do so. We have no less than four witnesses as to who it was who took advantage of the opportunity, and so, Mr. Barker, I think the word lies now with you." Sherlock Holmes put the sopping bundle upon the table beside the lamp, and undid the cord which bound it. From within he extracted a dumbbell, which he tossed down to its fellow in the corner. Next he drew forth a pair of boots. "'American, as you perceive,' he remarked, pointing to the toes. Then he laid upon the table a long, deadly, sheathed knife. Finally he unravelled a bundle of clothing comprising a complete set of underclothes, socks, a grey tweed suit, and a short yellow overcoat. "'The clothes are commonplace,' remarked Holmes, "'save only the overcoat which is full of suggestive touches.' He held it tenderly towards the light. "'Here, as you perceive, is the inner pocket prolonged into the lining in such a fashion as to give ample space for the truncated fowling piece. The tailor's tab is on the back. Neil Outfitter, Vermissa, USA. I have spent an instructive afternoon in the rector's library, and have enlarged my knowledge by adding the fact that Vermissa is a flourishing little town at the head of one of the best-known coal and iron valleys in the United States. I have some recollection, Mr. Barker, that you associated the coal districts with Mr. Douglas's first wife, and it would surely not be too far-fetched an inference that the V.V. upon the card by the dead body might stand for Vermissa Valley, or that this very valley, which sends forth emissaries of murder, may be that valley of fear which we have heard. So much is fairly clear. And now, Mr. Barker, I seem to be standing rather in the way of your explanation." It was a sight to see Cecil Barker's expressive face during this exposition of the great detective. Anger, amazement, consternation, and indecision swept over it in turn. Finally he took refuge in a somewhat acrid irony. "'You know such a lot, Mr. Holmes. Perhaps you had better tell us some more,' he sneered. 
I have no doubt that I could tell you a great deal more, Mr. Barker, but it would come with a better grace from you. Oh, you think so, do you? Well, all I can say is that if there's any secret here, it's not my secret, and I am not the man to give it away. Well, if you take that line, Mr. Barker, said the inspector quietly, we must just keep you in sight until we have the warrant and can hold you. You can do what you damn please about that, said Barker defiantly. The proceedings seemed to have come to a definite end, so far as he was concerned, for one had only to look at that granite face to realise that no pen forte or dur would ever force him to plead against his will. The deadlock was broken, however, by a woman's voice. Mrs. Douglas had been standing listening at the half-open door, and now she entered the room. "'You have done enough for now, Cecil,' said she. "'Whatever comes of it in the future, you have done enough.' "'Enough and more than enough,' remarked Sherlock Holmes gravely. "'I have every sympathy with you, madam, and should strongly urge you to have some confidence in the common sense of our jurisdiction, and to take the police voluntarily into your complete confidence. It may be that I am myself at fault for not following up the hint which you conveyed to me through my friend Dr. Watson, but at that time I had every reason to believe that you were directly concerned in the crime. Now I am assured that this is not so. At the same time there is much that is unexplained, and I should strongly recommend that you ask Mr. Douglas to tell us his own story." Mrs. Douglas gave a cry of astonishment at Holmes's words. The detectives and I must have echoed it, when we were aware of a man who seemed to have emerged from the wall, who advanced now from the gloom of the corner in which he had appeared. Mrs. Douglas turned, and in an instant her arms were round him. Barker had seized his outstretched hand. "'It's best this way, Jack,' his wife repeated. I'm sure that it is best." "'Indeed, yes, Mr. Douglas,' said Sherlock Holmes. "'I am sure that you will find it best.' The man stood blinking at us, with the dazed look of one who comes from the dark into the light. It was a remarkable face, bold grey eyes, a strong, short-clipped, grizzled moustache, a square projecting chin, and a humorous mouth. He took a good look at us all and then, to my amazement, he advanced to me, and handed me a bundle of paper. "'I've heard of you,' said he in a voice which was not quite English, and not quite American, but was altogether mellow and pleasing. "'You are the historian of this bunch. Well, Dr. Watson, you've never had such a story as that pass through your hands before, and I'll lay my last dollar on that. Tell it your own way, but there are the facts.' and you can't miss the public so long as you have those. I've been cooped up two days, and I've spent the daylight hours, as much daylight as I could get in that rat trap, in putting the thing into words. You're welcome to them, you and your public. There's the story of the Valley of Fear. That's the past, Mr. Douglas, said Sherlock Holmes quietly. What we desire now is to hear your story of the present. You'll have it, sir, said Douglas. May I smoke as I talk? Well, thank you, Mr. Holmes. You're a smoker yourself, if I remember right, and you'll guess what it is to be sitting for two days with tobacco in your pocket and afraid that the smell will give you away. He leaned against the mantelpiece and sucked at the cigar which Holmes had handed him. I've heard of you, Mr. Holmes. I never guessed that I would meet you, but before you're through with that, he nodded at my papers, you will say I've brought you something fresh. Inspector MacDonald had been staring at the newcomer with the greatest amazement. "'Well, this fairly beats me,' he cried at last. "'If you are Mr. John Douglas of Burlston Manor, then whose death have we been investigating for these two days, and where in the world have you sprung from now? You seem to come out of the floor like a jack-in-a-box.' "'Ah, Mr. Mac," said Holmes, shaking a reproving forefinger. You would not read that excellent local compilation which described the concealment of King Charles. People did not hide in those days without excellent hiding-places, and the hiding-place that had once been used may be used again. I had persuaded myself that we should find Mr. Douglas under this roof. 
"'And how long have you been playing this trick upon us, Mr. Holmes?' said the inspector angrily. "'How long have you allowed us to waste ourselves upon a search that you knew to be an absurd one?' "'Not one instant, my dear Mr. Mack. Only last night did I form my views of the case. As they could not be put to the proof until this evening, I invited you and your colleagues to take a holiday for the day. Pray, what more can I do?' When I found the suit of clothes in the moat, it at once became apparent to me that the body we had found could not have been the body of Mr. John Douglas at all, but must be that of the bicyclist from Tunbridge Wells. No other conclusion was possible. Therefore I had to determine where Mr. John Douglas himself could be, and the balance of probability was that with the connivance of his wife and his friend, he was concealed in a house which had such conveniences for a fugitive, and awaiting quieter times when he could make his final escape. "'Well, you figured it out about right,' said Douglas approvingly. "'I thought I'd dodge your British law, for I was not sure how I stood under it. And also I saw my chance to throw these hounds once for all off my track. Mind you, from first to last I've done nothing to be ashamed of, and nothing that I would not do again.' "'but you'll judge that for yourselves when I tell you my story. "'Never mind warning me, Inspector. "'I'm ready to stand pat upon the truth. "'I'm not going to begin at the beginning. "'That's all there.' "'He indicated my bundle of papers. "'And a mighty queer yarn you'll find it. "'It all comes down to this, "'that there are some men that have good cause to hate me "'and would give their last dollar to know that they had got to me. "'So long as I'm alive and they are alive... There is no safety in this world for me. They hunted me from Chicago to California, then they chased me out of America. But when I married and settled down in this quiet spot, I thought my last years were going to be peaceable. I never explained to my wife how things were. Why should I pull her into it? She would never have a quiet moment again, but would always be imagining trouble. I fancy she knew something, for I may have dropped a word here or a word there, but until yesterday, after you gentlemen had seen her, she never knew the rights of the matter. She told you all she knew, and so did Barker here, for on the night when this thing happened there was mighty little time for explanations. She knows everything now, and I would have been a wiser man if I had told her sooner. But it was a hard question, dear. He took her hand for an instant in his own, and I acted for the best. Well, gentlemen, the day before these happenings I was over in Tunbridge Wells, and I got a glimpse of a man in the street. It was only a glimpse, but I have a quick eye for these things, and I never doubted who it was. It was the worst enemy I had among them all, one who has been after me like a hungry wolf after a caribou all these years. I knew there was trouble coming, and I came home and made ready for it. I guess I'd fight through it all right on my own, my luck was a proverb in the States about seventy-six. I never doubted that it would be with me still. I was on my guard all that next day and never went out into the park. It's as well, or he'd have had the drop on me with that bookshut gun of his before ever I could draw on him. After the bridge was up, my mind was always more restful when that bridge was up in the evenings. I put the thing clear out of my head. I never dreamed of his getting into the house and waiting for me. But when I made my round in my dressing-gown, as was my habit, I had no sooner entered the study than I scented danger. I guess when a man has had dangers in his life, and I've had more than most in my time, there is a kind of sick sense that waves the red flag. I saw the signal clear enough, and yet I couldn't tell you why. Next instant I spotted a boot under the window curtain, and then I saw why plain enough. I had just the one candle that was in my hand, but there was a good light from the hall lamp through the open door. I put down the candle and jumped for a hammer that I'd left on the mantel. At the same moment he sprang at me. I saw the glint of a knife and I lashed at him with the hammer. I got him somewhere, for the knife tinkled down on the floor. He dodged round the table as quick as an eel, and a moment later he'd got his gun from under his coat. I heard him cock it. But I got hold of it before he could fire. I had it by the barrel, and we wrestled for it all ends up for a minute or more. It was death to the man that lost his grip. 
He never lost his grip, but he got it butt downward for a moment too long. Maybe it was I that pulled the trigger. Maybe we just jolted it off between us. Anyhow, he got both barrels in the face. And there I was, staring down at all that was left of Ted Baldwin. I'd recognized him in the township, and again, when he sprang for me. But his own mother wouldn't recognize him as I saw him then. I'm used to rough work, but I fairly turned sick at the sight of him. I was hanging on the side of the table when Barker came hurrying down. I heard my wife coming, and I ran to the door and stopped her. It was no sight for a woman. I promised I'd come to her soon. I said a word or two to Barker. He took it all in at a glance, and we waited for the rest to come along. But there was no sign of them. Then we understood that they could hear nothing and that all that had happened was known only to ourselves. It was at that instant that the idea came to me. I was fairly dazzled by the brilliance of it. The man's sleeve had slipped up, and there was the branded mark of the lodge upon his forearm. See here. The man whom we had known as Douglas turned up his own coat and cuff to show a brown triangle within a circle exactly like that which we'd seen upon the dead man. It was the sight of that which started me on it. I seemed to see it all clear at a glance. There were his height and hair and figure about the same as my own. No one could swear to his face, poor devil. I brought down this suit of clothes, and in a quarter of an hour Barker and I had put my dressing gown on him, and he lay as you found him. We tied all things into a bundle, and I weighted them with the only weight I could find, and put them through the window. The card he'd meant to lay upon my body was lying beside his own. My rings were put on his finger, but when it came to the wedding ring, he held out his muscular hand. You can see for yourselves that I had struck the limit. I have not moved it since the day I was married, and it would have taken a file to get it off. I don't know, anyhow, that I should have cared to part with it, but if I'd wanted to, I couldn't. So we just had to leave that detail to take care of itself. On the other hand, I brought a bit of plaster down and put it where I'm wearing one myself at this instant. You slipped up there, Mr. Holmes, clever as you are, for if you had chanced to take off that plaster, you'd have found no cut underneath it. Well, that was the situation. If I could lie low for a while and then get away, where I could be joined by my widow, we should have a chance at last of living in peace for the rest of our lives. These devils would give me no rest so long as I was above ground. But if they saw in the papers that Baldwin had got his man, there would be an end of all my troubles. I hadn't much time to make it all clear to Barker and to my wife, but they understood enough to be able to help me. I knew all about this hiding place, so did Ames, but it never entered his head to connect it with the matter. I retired into it, and it was up to Barker to do the rest. I guess you can fill in for yourselves what he did. He opened the window and made the mark on the sill, to give an idea of how the murderer escaped. It was a tall order, that, but as the bridge was up there was no other way. Then, when everything was fixed, he rang the bell for all he was worth. What happened afterward you know. And so, gentlemen, you can do what you please, but I've told you the truth and the whole truth, so help me God. What I ask you now is, how do I stand by the English law? There was a silence which was broken by Sherlock Holmes. The English law is in the main a just law. You'll get no worse than your deserts from that, Mr. Douglas. But I would ask you, how did this man know that you lived here, or how to get into your house, or where to hide to get you? I know nothing of this. Holmes's face was very white and grave. The story is not over yet, I fear, said he. You may find worse dangers than the English law, or even than your enemies from America. I see trouble before you, Mr. Douglas. You'll take my advice and still be on your guard. And now, my long-suffering readers, I'll ask you to come away with me for a time far from the Sussex Manor House of Burlston, and far also from the year of grace in which we made our eventful journey which ended with the strange story of the man who had been known as John Douglas. I wish you to journey back some twenty years in time, 
and westward some thousands of miles in space, that I may lay before you a singular and terrible narrative, so singular and so terrible that you may find it hard to believe that even as I tell it, even so did it occur. Do not think that I intrude one story before another is finished. As you read on you will find that this is not so. And when I have detailed those distant events, and you have solved this mystery of the past, we shall meet once more in those rooms on Baker Street, where this, like so many other wonderful happenings, will find its end. End of chapter 7 and part 1 of The Valley of Fear